Hello everybody, we are back again. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about chapter 3 um, in the Biochem 1 um, textbook. Talking about the structure, function, relationships in proteins. I'm just going to talk about all about the, the structure of proteins and also how it, uh, a couple of examples of how those proteins actually function um, together. So first we're going to describe the levels of 3D structures of proteins, including the types of bonds involved. If you remember before, we talked a little bit about a couple of different types of bonds. Talking about hydrogen bonds, we talked about sulfur bonds, uh, we talked about covalent bonds, ionic bonds. Um, so we're going to get back into all of those. If you don't remember um, the definitions of all of those, go ahead and pause now go back a little bit in the book um, or just run to Google real quick and refresh over the differences um, of those different types of bonds. We're going to talk about the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures of the proteins um, and then the, their functional significance of that. Comparing the different like the fibrous, globular, and transmembrane proteins with a couple of examples. Uh, the 3D structure is crucial um, for function of proteins, so we'll get into how um, the exact structure of each of the proteins, like how what we need um, structure-wise for proteins to function. The amino acid sequ sequence in protein folding, protein denaturation, and the effects of denaturing agents and conditions. Comparing and contrasting myoglobin and hemoglobin, we'll talk all about those guys, um, and then oxygen binding curves for those as well and then the hemoglobin variants and their clinical significance. We'll just get touch on that as well. Okay, so talking at the overview of protein structure and function. First of all, proteins have a covalent backbone. So what does that mean? If remember, we're talking about um, our covalent bonds, right? How the, um, the covalent bonds are going to be when two, sorry, give me one moment. Joys of recording at home, give me one sec. There we go. The covalent bond um, is going to be where two different atoms are actually sharing one or more pairs of the electrons between those two atoms. And whenever we talk about proteins, we're actually going to be talking about uh, peptide bonds. Peptide bonds are covalent, uh, covalent bonds, if I can spell. Covalent bonds. <clears throat> so this is when uh, there's going to be a lot of words that go back and forth, um, just making sure that we understand. They're saying the exact same thing. Um, just there are different words for it, specifically in different different uh, conditions. Now, the spatial arrangement of atoms in a protein is called its conformation. We'll get a little bit deeper into that later on. The 3D structure of a protein is determined by its amino acid sequence. So all of our proteins are made up of amino acids. So kind of the flow, we'll get more into this. The amino acids individually by themselves come from all of our foods or they're synthesized within the body. They are going to covalently bond, they form peptide bonds to form a peptide chain. The peptide chain will then fold um, into a 3D shape um, and that can be our final, uh, final protein or um, that folded peptide chain can then um, combine with other folded um, peptide chains to form a functioning protein. So the function of a protein depends on its structure. So the, the way that a protein is put together determines its structure. If the structure is not correct, the protein does not function. So that'll be how a protein folds and specifically the way that it folds is really, really important to the function of the protein. Uh, Non-covalent interactions stabilize specific protein 
structures. So we think about the non-covalent interactions. Uh, it's another form, another form of bonds. So the peptide bonds themselves, covalent. The um, stability of those specific proteins are through non-covalent interactions. Proteins function in enzyme um, cat uh, catalysis. Um, we'll get more into enzymes in the next chapter, so we'll kind of put a pin in that there. Uh, protein and pr protein, 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 carbohydrate, and protein lipid interaction um, are all very important. Protein transportation as a transporter. We'll get into kind of what a transporter actually is and what it actually what it does. It does exactly what it says. It's a, a protein um, is going to transport, move some sort of substance, whether that be from one location inside of a cell to another location, or it can be through a membrane as well. They provide our structural support, act as a protein buffer, and they can also do signal transduction, meaning that they, when a cell needs to communicate, it's going to do it through a process of signals, um, and it kind of has like a wave where you'll have something will come and bind to a specific protein. Binding to that protein, the protein will change shapes, and that causes a release of something else or some other reaction to continue on the correct message that it wants to send. So those non-covalent interactions that are stabilizing the protein structure that we're talking about, we have the hydrogen bonds. Remember, those are between two hydrogens. Um, a lot of times, like water is a really, really good example where high, high water will um, all stick together. Ionic bonds. Ionic bonds, this is one where um, they uneven, well, where uh, you'll have a positively charged or a cation will bind to a negatively charged anion. Um, so you'll have individual pieces of the protein that are positive versus negative to bind um, and form its shape. And then hydrophobic interactions for stabilizing the glob uh, globular form of proteins. So remember hydrophobic. Hydrophobic mean water fearing. We'll get more into that later. So the classic structures or structural classification of proteins. Uh, you can have fibrous proteins, you can have globular proteins, um, you can have membrane, and you can have membrane proteins. I think those are the only three. Yeah, those are the main three that we are going to be um, talking about. So this is just kind of a little bit of learn this, memorize this. If you think fibrous, insoluble, um, fibrous like grass, if you put grass into water, it doesn't dissolve or anything, it just kind of floats there. So insoluble meaning that it doesn't dissolve in water. And its main function is to support all of the structures around it. So collagen, keratin, um, both of those are found in our, our tendon and our skin. Keratin is in our fingernails, in our skin, all that sort of stuff. Um, so the, the, it's a structural kind of protein. Globular is water soluble. <coughs> Such as myoglobin. <coughs> Excuse me. Such as myoglobin and hemoglobin. We want myoglobin and hemoglobin to be soluble so that they can travel easily through fluids. The myoglobin, myo, means muscle. <coughs> the heme is blood. Uh, the suffix globin is actually going to mean it's just it's, it's a protein. Um, yeah, it just it just it's a form of the protein. The globular, globular. So it's a, a globin. It's, it's just describing the type of protein that it is. And both the function of both of these is to transport oxygen either in the muscle or in the blood. And this will look a lot at myoglobin and hemoglobin throughout this program um, because they do play a really critical role in our, in our uh, biochemistry as well as our physiology. Okay, so we can have um, membrane proteins doing a couple different things. They can be structural themselves, like they're weaving in and out through um, in a, in a membrane and being uh, on both sides. Uh, we'll look at G-protein binding um, and G-protein reactions um, later on. 
I don't remember if it is it is during um, this class or doing biochem 2, but we'll look at that later on. Proteins embedded in the membrane as well, so you can have proteins here on the out, a protein that goes through the membrane of the cell. And this is a lot that has to do typically with communication, where you can have a substance come in here and bind and cause a change to allow for another substance to be released to send signals from that extracellular matrix, extracellular portion of the body to the intracellular to let the the inside of the cell know what's going on and what it needs to do, whether it needs to make certain proteins or release certain um, materials. Okay, so the amino acids are polymerized by condensation to form peptide bonds. So we talked about, uh, I believe it was two videos ago, condensation hydration reactions is a type of reaction. If you see condensation or hydration, you immediately want to think water. Um, so water is either being um, created or being used to form the bonds. So we can see our individual peptides here, our peptides are amino acids. They have an OH and hydrogen group available. See uh, this H3N, HHN, and you have uh, another H coming off. They don't always draw it. But so this is going to form a reaction. Water will condense, will come out, and you will get a peptide bond. And remember, this is a covalent bond. Um, you remember the covalent bond? What's the difference between a covalent bond and an ionic bond? The covalent bond um, shares the electrons. One doesn't have more of the electrons than the other. Okay, and this process continues. So this is going to happen again and again and again and again and again, continuing until you develop your entire chain. And so you have what's called your amino terminal end and your carboxyl terminal end. And you can see, so we build from our amino end towards uh, our carboxyl end. The amino end, literally just saying that this right here, HCN, our ammonia, uh, is our or is our amide group, which is going to be our amino terminal end versus our carboxyl, C O the C double O two, um, is our carboxyl terminal end, and we build going that way. So the peptide bonds in protein has a trans configuration um, for carbonyl and amino groups. There are a couple of exception exceptions. Um, don't worry too much about this. Honestly, this is a little bit above our pay grade. It'll kind of pop up here and there, but it's not super important to like the big picture idea. Protein structure. This is the meat and potatoes we really want to get into. So primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Of our proteins, we're not going to have always all four of these. Okay? <clears throat> The primary, we'll, we'll keep going into this. Uh, a, a lot of proteins will stop right here and they won't have a quaternary structure. But some will go through all four and end at a quaternary structure. And we'll take a look at that as well. So the primary structure is the amino acid sequence of its polypeptide chain. Okay, so the amino acid sequence, the amino acids amino acid sequence of the polypeptide chain. So you see this polypeptide chain right here? All through here. Each of these, these three letter abbreviations, we talked a little bit about those when we talked about the amino acids. When we produce that chain, that is our primary structure. So you can literally write primary structure is our polypeptide chain. And it's derived by that covalent peptide bond formation. And you can also have disulfide linkage. Remember we talked about cysteine and cysteine, are more ones that will bind together 
with a um, disulfide linkage. Keep an eye on this. Whenever this pops up, this is a really good question to ask. And Boards also likes to talk about um, disulfide linkages and that cysteine and cysteine bind together. Um, any change in the structure of the peptide will alter its biological activity. So if you change even one, so let's say I took out this serine um, and made it another glutamate, immediately this entire protein structure is going to be different and will have a different function. Or it might may not function at all. So the import body the body needs to be very, very exact when it comes to these polypeptide chains. Otherwise the proteins won't fold correctly and they won't function properly. Okay. This right here, this is if you want to remember anything about primary structure, this is what you want to know. They are the amino acids coming together to form a polypeptide chain. Secondary structure. So after we've formed our polypeptide chain, we're going to move on to this next step of what, what's that chain then going to do. So the polypeptide chain um, is able to it essentially folds. It's going to react with all the other individual um, amino acids that are all together, all the different peptides. And it's going to fold into one of two groups that we're going to focus on. Either it forms into an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. So any time that you see either of these words, alpha helix or beta pleated sheet, immediately think secondary structure. Okay? The hydrogen bonds causes the bends and the folds of the peptide chains to form these. So if we're looking at bonds, the bonds of the uh, of the primary structure is primarily due to covalent peptide bonds and also depending on the protein disulfide uh, linkage. That could pop up as a question. So your secondary structure is your hydrogen bonds. Any question you ask about what um, what type of bond forms your secondary structure? What type of bond forms your alpha helix, your beta, or your beta pleated sheet? Hydrogen bonds. Okay, let's look at each of these individually. So the alpha helix is a common protein secondary structure. Remember, it's secondary, which means it's what type of bond? We just talked about this. Just said it. Hydrogen bonds. Remember that. With a spiral configuration. The side chains of the amino acids are directed outward. The alpha helix is stabilized by hydrogen bonds within the peptide structure itself. Each peptide bond forms hydrogen bonding. Uh, each peptide bond forms H bonding and provides maximum stability. So hydrogen bonds are, even though like it's just between hydrogen, you think like water, you can kind of separate drops. Hydrogen bonding in a whole, hydrogen bonding is considered very, very strong. So it's very, very good for having that good, solid stability. It says, however, the presence of proline can disrupt the alpha helix structure of a polypeptide. The alpha amino group of proline is bonded and exists as an alpha amin uh, amino group and thus has no free hydrogen atom that can contribute for H bonding. So talking about proline, uh, I don't remember this being a super big point in this class. Um, just that if there's going to be a breakage somewhere in that secondary structure of the alpha helix, it's going to be caused by a proline. That's the that's the point that I would take out of this. Um, not something that I would overly concern yourself with, but probably a good little factoid to know. And if you hear it get brought up in lecture um, specifically, make a note of that um, so that way you can you can remember that. And if you're making flashcards or whatever include that in your in your studies. Okay, uh, presence of some other charged or bulkier side chain can also interfere with hydrogen bond formation in alpha helix formation. So the peptide bonds participate in the hydrogen bonding by the carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen hydrogen groups. So because we have these those available hydrogens, and like I said, the, the side chains are going to be off uh, 
um, towards the outside, the hydrogens will then be able to bond together. Um, this right here is an exam question. I promise you it's on the exam. If not one of them, uh, if not your, your first lecture exam, it will be on your final. Um, just saying that the right-handed alpha helixes are more stable therm thermodynamically. So our right-handed helix is what we will see. And if you see this word helix, it should stir a little memory. We'll get there eventually. Double helix is our DNA. Okay, beta pleated sheets. Beta sheets are composed of laterally packed beta strands of polypeptide chains and is extended, not condensed. Uh, it is it is extended, not condensed in the helical like the alpha helical structure. When the adjacent polypeptide chains in a beta pleated sheet run in opposite directions, N terminus, N terminus being that amino, the nitrogen terminus, to the C terminus, C terminal being that carboxyl group. Remember that COO, and this was our NH3. The structure, uh, so when they, when the beta pleated sheet runs in opposite directions, the N terminus is C terminus, the structure is called uh, an anti parallel beta pleated sheet. When the chains run in the same direction, N terminus, N terminus, it is called parallel beta pleated sheet. So we have our anti parallel N terminus to C terminus, then C terminus to N, N to C, versus N to C, N to C, N to C. Okay? And those hydrogen bond crosslinks, crosslink between the adjacent chains. Again, hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds for all of these. For our secondary structures, it is hydrogen bonds. Uh, this is just another picture again showing that our anti parallel versus parallel and the hydrogen bonding that is taking place. Anti parallel beta sheets consist of polypeptide strands that extend in opposite directions. The parallel beta sheets consist of polypeptide strands that extend in the same direction. Just saying that, again, from the end terminal, from the this end has the amino side, the nitrogen side, this side has the carboxyl, also nitrogen, carboxyl, nitrogen, carboxyl, and these ones run opposite. Parallel beta sheets are less stable than the anti-parallel sheets because the hydrogen bonding connecting the polypeptides are slightly distorted. So when it talks about this, where which one's stronger, just remember the anti-parallel sheets are, str uh, are stronger. Mixed beta pleated sheets consist of both parallel and anti-parallel peptide chains are common. Uh, oh, and, and this as well, this is a good thing to make note of. Within these sheets, you'll have a turn, so you go down and turn, turn so those connections where, the, where it's all, where it's connected. Um, typically, you're gonna have glycine and proline are going to form those turns in the beta beta pleated sheets. And that is because glycine is small and flexible. Um, and the peptide bonds involving amino nitrogen of the proline mostly form the cis configuration form a tight turn. Yeah. Don't worry too much about all the extra words. Remember glycine, remember proline. Those are the ones where if it's going to turn, those where it, that is where it likes to turn. Okay. Now we finished the secondary structure. So remember, primary has what type of bonds? It is our covalent bonds, and it is our amino acid chain, our polypeptide chain. Secondary structures are hydrogen bonds, alpha helix, beta pleated sheets. So anytime you talk about those know that they're second in our tertiary. So once we have formed um, the beta pleated sheets and the alpha helixes, now we're gonna get to the overall 3D structure of an entire polypeptide, which at this point, once it's finished, is folding in this way, 
it can be considered a, an active and a functional protein um, at this point, once it reaches its tertiary structure. And this is when the alpha helices and the beta sheets are combined in a variety of ways to form motifs. That is the, the fun word of this section. Motif literally means um, it's like a repeated pattern or some kind of like uh, symbol or kind of like an artsy sort of thing. It's just a way. What what it's saying is just it's 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 form and it, it's ways to form motif. It forms its specific its pattern and everything that goes on. So beta alpha beta loop, for example, you have an alpha helix connects to a beta sheet. Um, on both sides. So you have a beta sheet connects to the alpha helix, which connects to another beta sheet, and that forms its full motif. So you have a really, really long peptide chain. And so this chunk right here, its structure will like a nice alpha helix. This chunk right here will want to be a beta pleated sheet. And then this next chunk that's over here and so there, this next chunk over here wants to be another alpha helix, and that would be an alpha, beta, alpha, just like that. And that's, at that point, it can be a functional protein. Um, in some cases, though, these tertiary proteins will combine with other tertiary proteins to form a quaternary structure. Quaternary structure, each of these each of these different colors, so this blue, uh, the yellow, the purple, and the black, each of these are representing a, an individual polypeptide chain that it's all coming together to form a larger functional protein. So you get more peptide chains come together to form a bigger protein. Um, this is how hemoglobin gets formed. Uh, we have actually have four different um, proteins that all come together to form hemoglobin, and we'll see that in a, in a little bit. So the 3D arrangement of polypeptides in a protein composed of multiple polypeptides. For some of these examples, hemoglobin, insulin, collagen, immunoglobulins for our immune cells, immunity, all of these are going to be used, all of these are going to have quaternary structure. Uh, and those are joined by non-covalent interaction. Let me see. I believe in the um, in his PowerPoint when you talk about it, he go does go over um, a type of bond with the tertiary structure. Um, I believe it's it's again non-covalent bonds, uh, like the hydrogen type bonding and, and other stuff like that. Um, but double check that when you watch his lectures and just keep an eye eye, eye on that. Um, if he mentions a very, if he mentioned, if they mentioned a very sp a specific type of bond for the tertiary structure, then note that down as well. Okay. Here we have our beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picture. Primary structure, our amino acid residues, to secondary structure, alpha helix or beta pleated sheet, or a combination of the two. Our tertiary structure, all those those alpha helix and those beta pleated sheets interact with each other to form a nice chunk. And right here, this could be our beautiful functional protein, or it can combine with other proteins or other um, tertiary structures to form a larger quaternary structure and a larger functional protein. So proteins in any of their functional and folded conformations are called native proteins. Just a little vocab for you um, when they're in their functional and folded conformation, native protein. So the importance of the 3D structure in the native proteins is it provides stability, is a big one. It's specific function, solubility, so whether it's soluble or insoluble soluble in water determines a lot where um, that protein is able to go to and where it is able to reside and where it's able to carry out its function. Um, fluctuating flexibility of conformation, allowing diffusion of small molecules. So flexibility of conformation, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, you can have, if other um, 
bits and pieces of other molecules or other um, the right the right word is is escaping me right now, but of other stuff it can bind to a segment or chunk a binding site on one of these proteins, its actual shape is going to change. And by changing that shape, it's then able to function differently. Um, so for example, something can, like insulin, for example. Um, insulin only works, uh, or better, better, better one is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, because we'll talk about that in a minute. Hemoglobin, oxygen binds to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is able to hold and bind four different oxygens, um, but it's not able to bind another oxygen until it one binds. So an oxygen binds, its conformation, its shape changes slightly, allowing another oxygen to come and bind. That oxygen binding allows it to change its shape again slightly to open up another spot for another oxygen to come and bind. <clears throat> and it can do that up to, up to four times. Uh, okay, so native proteins are marginally stable at physiological conditions. Physiological conditions are, I believe I mentioned this, our blood, uh, we need, we, our body likes a very specific pH. 7.35 to 7.45 is typically what people say. 7.3 to 7.4-ish. Um, if our body goes outside of those physiological conditions, we start to have issues. Uh, Non-polar residues tend to occupy the core of a native protein due to the hydrophobic effects. Remember, our body is mostly water, so the non-polar amino acids tend to be at the front, at the, at the core in the middle of those proteins because they're surrounded by water. The polar residues tend to be at the protein surface so they can interact with the water and a loss of the native structure of the proteins is called denaturation. So denaturation, any time that the, um, the sh s functional shape of that protein is altered by something that's not supposed to happen, whether that be like a, an outside chemical, it can be a temperature change or a pH change, that kind of stuff. Um, when you change the structure of it, it starts to unravel that structure, that is denaturation. So loss of protein structure results in loss of its function. The factors that can cause denaturation of a protein could be heat, changes in pH, certain reagents of certain chemicals, such as detergent, urea, alcohols. That's why so detergent, um, the reason why detergent gets out stains is because of this chemical reaction where it actually will bind to the proteins that are there and will actually rip them apart and pull them apart, which is how it gets it out of clothes and stuff. Uh, urea, alcohols, strong bases, or some non-enzymatic modifications. The amino acid sequence of the protein determines its tertiary structure, and the polypeptides fold rapidly by a syst uh, systematic stepwise manner. Some proteins undergo assisted folding. That means that there are some proteins have a helper protein come and help them fold appropriately um, and others will just do so in, uh, by themselves. So defective protein folding results in diseases. So if we have um, issues producing specific proteins that's when we're going to have um, specific diseases, and we'll we'll name a couple of those diseases um, in this class um, that it, where you have issues either processing um, certain proteins or either breaking them down or actually building certain proteins um, or being able to do work with certain amino acids. Under proper conditions, most unfolded proteins will renature spontaneously. Remember, because all of those reactions that are occurring um, in the secondary and tertiary structure are going to be those non-covalent reactions. So those hydrogen bonding and everything. So once it's put back into its happy zone, its physiological zone where it wants to be, it'll go back to its original structure as long as it wasn't completely destroyed. So this indicates that their tertiary structure is dictated by primary structure. So the secondary and tertiary and quaternary structure is all dictated by the primary 
structure. Primary structure is the most important. If you have an extreme of pH, heat, strong acid, or base, you can permanently destroy the native conformation. This is how like a lot of disinfectants and stuff, that's how they work. You're literally taking something, so like bleach, for example, or like alcohol. Um, alcohol and bleach are strong acids and base. They um, permanently will destroy, over time will permanently destroy the normal conformation of, of like bacteria of microorganisms because it destroys their proteins. Denaturation and renaturation of a protein. Again, this is just repeating exactly what we said, going back from that polypeptide chain, the native state to the unfolded state, back to the native state. Okay, myoglobin and hemoglobin. Uh, these are the structure function relations in myoglobin and hemoglobin. We love myoglobin and we love hemoglobin. Okay, so hemoglobin is a tetrameric uh, protein, meaning it has four subunits, so it has quaternary structure. Myoglobin is a monomeric protein. It has one subunit, so it is good at its tertiary structure. Quaternary, tertiary. The myoglobin uh, is stores the oxygen in the muscles. Myo is muscle. The hemoglobin transports the oxygen through the blood. So the heme group is present in myoglobin and hemoglobin and many other proteins. Heme, you're gonna see the Fe is going to be iron. So that's why when you say like, you need iron for your blood, you can check your blood and you're low on iron. Iron is needed for hemoglobin and myoglobin, which is for oxygen transport. That's why somebody with, for example, with anemia um, one of the causes of anemia, you can have an iron deficiency anemia. And that person will be pale and not have good oxygen. Um, they'll feel weak because their body's not getting the oxygen that it needs. Myoglobin is the single peptide containing a heme group. Um, this iron is present in myoglobin. Can, iron present in myoglobin can bind oxygen. Oxidized myoglobin is called metmyoglobin. This is just, again, some, some vocab for you. Good idea, pull, these, pull some of these words out as you see them um, so that you can, let me highlight, so that you can start to kind of build your vocab sheet to look through and, and understand what all of these words are. Um, because as, as these, you, what you, the last thing you wanna do on a test is be trying to figure out what words mean. Um, if you can have all of these words if you can recognize, start to see these and recognize them, um, it just makes taking exams and stuff a lot easier with biochemistry. Metmyoglobin cannot bind oxygen because it already has. It's already because it's already been oxidized. Myoglobin transport oxygen to muscle and acts as an oxygen storage protein. Oxygen storage protein. So super easy to ask, test question. Which of the following transports oxygen? His hemoglobin. Which of the following stores oxygen? Myoglobin. And then again, where are either of those located? Um, you can say, um, yeah, you guys question about myoglobin being, um, true or false, metmyoglobin can, metmyoglobin can bind oxygen. That'd be false. Okay. These figures we'll want to look at. So this figure is showing a representative uh, oxygen binding curve for hemoglobin and myoglobin. PO2 represents the partial pressure of oxygen measured in millimeters of mercury. So partial pressure is going to be, it's, it's related to how much oxygen that there is in the air. So like the amount of pressure that is in the air all around us is considered one atmosphere. And the PO2 is gonna be that partial pressure of oxygen, which matters when we start to talk about um, uh, gas exchange. Okay. Do, 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 do. 
uh, in millimeters of mercury is our measurement of pressure. And it represents the concentration of oxygen dissolved in blood. Hemoglobin has high oxygen affinity at high partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs. So when we have a high partial pressure, when we have a lot of oxygen in our lungs, hemoglobin has an affinity or it really likes to grab and bind onto oxygen. Okay? Whereas hemoglobin has low oxygen affinity at low PO2 in tissues and in venous blood. So at the tissue, this is what we want. When we have a lot of oxygen around, we want the hemoglobin to grab the oxygen. And when we don't have a lot of oxygen, we want it to have low affinity so that it releases it into the tissues. The decrease in partial pressure of oxygen helps in unloading of oxygen in the tissue. So if we think about um, why is it lower in the tissues, because we've been using it. In the tissues, we use oxygen and it gets converted to CO2. So in the tissue, we have high CO2, low oxygen, which means our hemoglobin affinity for oxygen is low. Hemoglobin affinity for CO2 is high in the tissues, so in our tissue, like in the muscle tissue. In the lungs, we have high oxygen, so hemoglobin has a high affinity for O2. The lung has low CO2 comparatively to the other tissue comparatively to the oxygen. And so hemoglobin has a low affinity for CO2 and dumps it off in the lung to replace it with oxygen. And you'll get a lot more into that um, as you go deeper into, um, <clears throat> into physiology, especially in try two. Phys 1, you'll get a little bit more into this with oxygen and, and gas exchange and that sort of stuff. Okay, uh, this decrease in partial pressure of oxygen helps in unloading of oxygen in the tissue. Myoglobin is saturated at normal pressure, partial pressure of oxygen in the skeletal muscle and releases oxygen only when the tissue becomes hypoxic or meaning that it needs oxygen. Thus, myoglobins better serve um, as oxygen storage protein. Okay. So our oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Uh, this is, and I think I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pause here um, and we're gonna jump back into this in another video. Actually, let me see how close we're to the end. Uh, we're pretty close. We'll just keep going. Okay, <clears throat> so the O2 hemoglobin binding, uh, it's allosteric binding. And again, if at any point there's a word that's a little bit, you don't know the exact definition, Google it. I love Google. Allosteric binding is a reversible form of regulation. A reversible form of regulation is known as allosteric regulation where a regulatory molecule binds reversibly to the protein, altering its conformation. Okay? So allosteric binding means that when, when oxygen binds, hemoglobin conformation or shape changes. It's going to produce a sigmoidal curve. Sigmoidal just in that, that S shape. Uh, it indicates multiple binding sites. We talked about this a little bit ago where hemoglobin will be able to bind multiple oxygen. And it signifies cooperative binding of O2. It reflects loading and unloading 
of O2 as well. So this is just showing right down here, that partial pressure. So the veins, um, here is, we can, we can see, look, this is what you want, this is what we want to focus here. The amount of O2 unloaded to tissues. So we can see here at the arteries, the arteries, the hemoglobin will be 100% saturated. And as it goes through all the different tissues, eventually getting to the veins, it's, as it goes through the tissues, it's unloading oxygen until it gets to about this venous portion here, a little bit below um, 80%. So at, at all times, um, our blood, like our blood is gonna be fairly well oxygenated, even when it's um, at the venous side. So this figure is showing a representative oxygen binding curve, oxygen binding curve for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has high oxygen affinity at high PO2 in the lungs, whereas hemoglobin has low affinity, oxygen affinity at low PO2 in the tissues. This is the same, exact same thing that we just talked about. This decrease in PO2 helps in unloading of oxygen in the tissues. Also near the tissues, high level of carbon dioxide produced due to metabolism forms carbonic acid. So our high carbon dioxide forms carbonic acid. And in the acidic environment, so we think talk about pH, when we have an increase in acid, um, more acid means more hydrogen, higher hydrogen means lower pH. So we end up with a lower pH. So the bonding affinity or what it wants to bind to, to hemoglobin um, decreases and oxygen unloading is enhanced. Uh, all of this, this is a bunch of repeat, exactly what we were talking about, um, what we talked about all before. Cooperative binding, we mentioned this a little bit. Um, so like when one oxygen binds, it's going to change its shape to allow for another oxygen to bind and then it changes its shape. Another one binds and it changes its shape and another oxygen to bind changes its shape and that's in its final travel form with all four parts bound to oxygen. O2 binding to hemoglobin is allosteric. Allosteric meaning that it's going to change the conformation of it. Positive corrective binding. Binding of the first O2 to the first hemoglobin subunit changes the conformation facilitating the binding of the second and so on. Just exactly what we were talking about. Binds the first one, helps to change its shape, allowing for the next one to bind. That produces that sigmoid curve that we saw. There's the four binding sites for O2. Remember those four binding sites are from four different peptide chains that are all together, meaning that this, that hemoglobin has quaternary structure, whereas myoglobin has tertiary only. The cooperative properties of hemoglobin molecule to oxygen binding is in red, red blood cells is affected by changes in pH and by levels of carbon dioxide. Remember we talked about the carbon dioxide affects the pH levels. And also 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate and various other ions. These are the main two that we will talk about a lot. pH, carbon dioxide, O2, that sort of stuff. However, the changes in the levels of these chemicals does not influence myoglobin binding. Here we have the dissociation curve uh, promoting the release of O2. You'll talk a lot more about this in physiology one in trimester two, but just showing that when you have changes in those partial pressure in the pH or in the temperature, all this sort of stuff, you'll get shift of the oxygen saturation, whether it's dropping more, o more oxygen off or choosing to hold on to the oxygen itself. The Bohr effect. This is what this is actually showing, this this curve here, talking about the Bohr effect. Bohr effect, you mostly just want to know definition. It's the effect of that pH, the CO2, the temperature, and the big long 2,3 BPG, causing a right shift of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. So it's causing a shift. This red is the, this, uh, the orange, sorry, orange is the normal, and shifting to the right. So we have an increase of the partial pressure of oxygen because we have more, we've used the oxygen and converted it to CO2. 
So now we get a shift to the right, meaning that we have less saturation in that area. And so we're going to offload more oxygen into that area when it becomes available. Uh, we have an increase in CO2 levels in tissues. In tissues, decreases pH and promotes release of O2 into the tissues. In the lungs, the reaction is reversed, meaning that we want to drop off the CO2 and take up more oxygen. Uh, a lot of this we'll get into a little bit later. And just the last little note, this is just again talking more about the Bohr effect. We really don't go this deep into the Bohr effect. I wouldn't worry too much about all of this at this point right now. Um, a good note, so fetal hemoglobin um, is a tetramere and it does not bind to 2,3-BPG and they have higher affinity um, for O2 than adult hemoglobin. So this, I remember he, he did ask a question like this on the exam, just saying that the fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than the adult version does. So as a baby, your body's going to really need that oxygen because um, it has a lot of metabolism going on. So you have a different type of hemoglobin. You have this fetal hemoglobin um, that, does, that works better than our adult hemoglobin. Sickle cell hemoglobin, so sickle cell trait um, is a single nucleotide change in the beta chain which changes the amino acid glutamate to a valine. I would remember that, glutamate to valine um, at the position six of the beta chain. So the beta chain of hemoglobin uh, sickle has very low affinity for oxygen. That's why people with sickle cell, it's called sickle cell anemia, Um, this is a, a genetic disease um, that is passed down. To have full-blown sickle cell anemia, you have to have both parents with the gene. Um, if you get just one, you, can ha you will have sickle cell trait, um, which actually is a, a protectant against malaria, which is interesting, which is why a lot of people who descend from African countries um, actually do tend to have higher rates of sickle cell anemia and sickle cell trait because um, for some like a malaria has a harder time binding to sickle cell blood and surviving in that area in that um, in that environment so it's actually a benefit to have a sickle cell trait sickle cell anemia can is can be deadly and um, uh, many people die from sickle cell anemia but just having the one trait um, is beneficial in those instances but yeah it just it makes it harder because it's changed the conformation we said that any of the changes in the amino uh, acids changes its shape and by changing its shape you change its function so it has a much harder time binding oxygen than it normally should and that is chapter three our next chapter we'll talk a little bit about enzymes uh, this one was a little bit longer um, hopefully you got the the big big chunks out of it um, go through go through this chapter um, and also watch his his lecture video on this um, you'll see kind of the what I would highly recommend is that the use the lecture watch the lecture first to understand kind of the big main ideas and um, or you can even watch these in tandem so start the lecture recording start the recordings get to a certain point read through the material in the book up to that point and make sure that you understand it and then bounce back and forth between um, because all of this information that he has is just a short and broken down version of exactly what's written in the book so if you can read read just the book and understand it or just if these videos are really helpful for you um, perfect um, but these will be like the key points to focus on um, as you go through the material. Awesome. Have a great day. Good luck studying and do your best.